Frank Buckman, who was the founder of the Oxford Group, where a lot of what happens in AA comes from the Oxford Group. It's been changed to fit us, but a lot of the basic principles of spiritual discovery came from them. And Frank Buckman, I'll tell you a little story about Frank Buckman. Frank, the, on page 52 of the big book, it talks about the bedevilments. And in, if you read about Frank Buckman, this is almost a description of Frank Buckman, who didn't have alcoholism, but he struggled with all the things that alcoholics struggle with. In the, in the middle of the page, the third line down in the second paragraph is a description of a guy like me when I stopped drinking. And a lot of this stuff was true for Frank Buckman. We were having trouble with personal relationships. I don't know about Canada. That's big in the United States, uh, the relationship problems. We couldn't control our emotional natures. We were prey to misery and depression. We couldn't make a living. We had a feeling of uselessness. We were full of fear. We were unhappy. We couldn't seem to be of real help to other people. Frank Buckman was a guy who had got a calling and he was trying to be a minister. He wanted to help God's kids. And he was a washout. He was unaffected. He, he really couldn't... He didn't have a very good connection with God. It was very theoretical. And he tried to help people. And he was, like, he was kind of a preachy guy. And, you know, he, he really... People just kind of... Yeah, that's nice, Frank. And they kind of stayed away from him. And he was trying to be a minister. And he was like... He had nobody to minister to, really. I mean, he was trying... And he was over he was over in England and some guy said to him, Man, you ought to come down to the Salvation Army. There's a woman down there that's going to testify tonight that spent her life down there working in Skid Row with the homeless and she has a tremendous message. And it's amazing. The amazing thing is that Frank went. And that reason that's amazing, if you knew anything about Frank Buckman, Frank first of all, Frank Buckman came from a headset where he he it's not that he was a chauvinist. He was kind of a chauvinist. He thought, you know, he was had the mindset of, he'd hear more stuff from men than women, that kind of thing, right? He had that little prejudice going on. And he also, this is a woman who spent her life on Skid Row helping the poor. And Frank Buckman was one who wanted to minister to the rich. He wanted to minister to captains of industry. So for him to be open-minded to a woman who worked on Skid Row was a miracle. And I think the only reason he did that, he was very distraught and he, he felt like he was at the end of his rope. And he went down there to the Salvation Army downtown London and he heard this woman talk and she said something that blew his mind. And she was sharing strictly from her experience. And she, what she talked about, she said, if you're blocked, if you seem to be disconnected from God and you can't help God's kids effectively, the problem is within you and the blockage is within you. You must, you must find the things within you that are blocking you and let go of them and get rid of them in order to open. You cannot access God's grace by direct assault. You access it by moving away the blockage. And Frank had never heard, he, Frank had spent his life reading the Bible and prayer and all kinds of reading spiritual literature, and he'd never heard that before. And so he, uh, he put together this, this, this set of uh, things that he called moral rearmament, which later were, were named the Oxford Group. And Bill Wilson took a lot of that stuff from that. And Frank Buckman believed that you really didn't turn your will and your life over to God until after you cleaned house. And oddly enough, that is the experience that I had and most people in AA have. You take the third step and you do it because of a lack of alternatives, because you, you don't have anywhere else to go. But you really don't start to feel like you actually have carried it out and are connected to God until further on down and you're cleaning house and you've cleared away some of the stuff between you and God. And that's where you really feel like you're connected. And that was his experience. That this is the ultimate step of surrender, is step seven. One of the greatest surrenders in history was, was what happened in the, in the mid-1940s. The Empire of Japan was faced with ultimate destruction and annihilation. Two atomic weapons had been set off in two of their major cities. And they had no atomic weapons. They had no defense against that. They had no way to stop it. We, we, we could have bombed them with atomic bombs into, into the Stone Age, and there was nothing they could have done about it. 
And I can't imagine a, a more fear-wrought surrender because they were forced into a position to surrender to their enemy in the face of the knowledge that their enemy knew what they had done at Pearl Harbor, that their enemy knew what they had done to their enemy soldiers in the prisoners of war camp, that the enemy knew what the, all the people that they'd killed from, the, from their enemy's camps, and yet they had a lack of alternatives and they were forced to come to the table. And in the Pacific Fleet, the Japanese in the mid-40s signed the formal terms of surrender, and which was really their third step. But they were required to do some things, and one of the things they were required to do with the help of their enemy is they had to take an inventory of all their defenses, their planes, their ships, their bombs, their standing armies, and then they had to offer to expose in the open and dismantle and turn over for inspection to their enemy all their defenses and give them to their enemy and really literally make themselves defenseless. And at that point, the United States, with very little effort, because they could have come in there and wiped out the Japanese nation. Because they no longer, that we have they'd given up their standing army, their navy, their air force. But they entered into that contract and they never breached it. To this day, the Japanese have never militarized themselves. They have never uh, undid that surrender. They have never created a standing army or, or taken a military aggressive position in this world. And as a result of that surrender, they, they developed a culture of service. And in that culture of service, I was over in Japan 15 years ago, I guess, at an AA conference. And I, I stayed for about 10 days and I saw some amazing things. I, the companies in Japan, uh, they had a, they, they, they were, the employee ethic was selfless. It was all about what I can do for you, what I can do for the company, what I can do for the whole. And as a result of this ultimate surrender and service, within four decades, the Japanese owned more of the United States than they could have ever conquered by military means or held. They owned more of the United States. And isn't that ultimately the story you hear in Alcoholics Anonymous? I mean, really, we are people who have, have fought the hard fight. We are people who have banged our head against that wall of life over and over and over, trying to wrest happiness and satisfaction out of this world until we're almost destroyed ourselves. And we're forced by a lack of alternatives into an ultimate surrender. And if we can do that and stick to it, and dismantle our defenses and really turn them over to this power that is greater than ourself. The story of Alcoholics Anonymous is in within no time at all. Everything that we fought for and could not get just comes to us. And it's you hear that story, if you go to meetings of AA, you'll hear that story in people's lives over and over and over and over again. It is really what happens here. The story of surrender. Now we need more action, without which we find that faith without works is dead. Let's look at steps eight and nine. This is this is the stuff that terrified me the most. But you know, in a funny kind of way, Alcoholics Anonymous was founded on step eight. Those of you that know the history of AA or are familiar with this story, uh, Mother's Day weekend, 1935, a washed up stockbroker who was afraid he was going to drink again because his one hope for getting back on his feet financially was dashed. Paced a lobby of the Mayflower Hotel, a lobby I've stood in many times. He made a series of phone calls and through a series of phone calls he got in touch with a, with a woman named Henrietta Cyberling who had a friend who was a, a used up, drunken, washed up proctologist named Dr. Bob Smith. And the, on that particular day, Bill Wilson wants to talk to him and Bob really couldn't see Bill at that moment because Bob was taking a nap under the dining room table. <laughs> and the next day, uh, unwillingly, Bob Smith was drugged by Ann, his wife, 
to the Cyberling Mansion Gatehouse, and, and his son and I become became very good friends, and we were good friends up until he died not too long ago. And, and Smitty would tell the story of his of going in the car with them to the to the Cyberling Mansion, and, and how Bob was bitching about the I don't want to hear some Yankee tell me about my drinking, you know. And I, all right, 15, 20 minutes, that's it. Then you got to get, you got to promise, Ann, get me out of here. You got to get, you can't let me in. No more than that. And Ann was, okay. And Bob Smith went in to talk to Bill Wilson. And for the first time in his life, he was enthralled by what he heard because Bill Wilson did not try to tell Bob about Bob's drinking. Bill Wilson told Bob about Bill's drinking. And Bob had never heard that before. And he identified and he felt amazingly connected to this man to the point where they stayed in there for several hours he was enthralled and they came out with bill bob had his arm around bill and he said we're bringing this guy home and he went and bill wilson went home and to with the smiths and lived at their house and and they sat around and talked about spiritual discoveries and prayer and meditation and surrender and they talked about helping others and bill started to tell bob about the the amends part of the program and bob dug his feet in and he said, Bill, I, I, I like all this stuff. It's all good. But I, uh, you don't understand. See, I've, I've hurt my reputation in this community a lot already through my drunkenness. I, I just need to leave that alone. I don't really want to go out and expose myself to those people and face those people. I'll do everything else, but I won't do that. And Dr. Bob ultimately drank again. He went to a medical convention in, in Atlantic City. He got so drunk there and so drunk coming back that... The, he, was, he was unconscious by the time the train pulled up to the Akron station with the help of a conductor they laid him on the platform next to where the train took off and called his office nurse who came running down there to, to take care of him as she always did when he was on his sprees and she called Ann and Ann and Bill Wilson came down there and they got him and took him home and put him into bed and he was a mess and he came too early in the wee hours of the morning on what we believe was June 10th. And he came too shaken as we all come to after coming off a long drunk, jumping out of his skin. And he said, what day is it? And they said, it's June 10th. And Bob said, oh, my God, it can't be June 10th. I have a surgery this morning. And you can imagine what kind of surgery it was. Dr. Bob was a proctologist. I mean... Can you imagine what it would be like to have been the patient and watch your doctor come in vibrating like that? I mean, really. Shoo! I mean, we should build a statue of that guy somewhere. And Dr. Bill gave Dr. Bob uh, his last couple of drinks and a sedative and sent him into the surgery. And he gave him that to quiet his nerves so he wouldn't be vibrating so much. And, uh, and we don't know what happened to that patient. We know that he lived. That's all we know. Right? <laughs> My friend Bill P. is an archivist and a historian. He went to the Akron Hospital records and tried to find out information about this guy. And he couldn't find out. All we know is he lived. I mean, we don't know what happened to him. And I'd like to know. I mean, did he whistle when he walked or what? I mean, you know. You know. <clears throat> and Dr. Bob got out of that surgery early that morning and disappeared. Disappeared off the face of the earth. And Bob and or, and Bill and uh, Ann were worried, and I'm sure Bill, I'm sure, was worried because he gave him a couple drinks that morning. And I'm sure Bill thought, well, I screwed up. The guy's on a run now. We lost him. But he didn't go on a run. And he spent the rest of that morning and all that afternoon and late into the late evening searching out everybody he'd owed amends to that he was unwilling prior to that to face. And he faced all those creditors he could find and all those people. And Dr. Bob never drank again until the day he died of natural causes. And I think our program, in a sense, was founded on step eight. I don't know what would have become of us if Dr. Bob would have dug his heels in one more time and said, Bill, I ain't doing that part of it. But he did it, and the rest is history. We are here. So in a strange kind of sense, AA was founded on step eight. And I'll tell you something. I understand Dr. Bob's fear I understand it. I, this step terrorized me when I was new. I remember sitting in the rooms and hearing people talk about amends and just going, Oh my God, no, I can't do this. 
I could see how you could do it. I mean, you were fairly nice people. I, it's, I'm sure you did some things that were out of line. Maybe you patted your expense account or you got drunk and said something unkind to your wife. Good for you. Make amends. Build your character. Great. I had guys that went to prison as a result of me. Some outlaw bikers that went to prison. I had a guy that I, to this day I've hired detectives, never been able to find him, and I opened up his chest with a hunting knife. I had people that I just devastated their life. I lived on the streets like an animal. And I, I can't even tell you, I, I, to this day I've never found everybody that I've robbed because there's nameless, faceless people. I was the kind of guy that I would just go down the street and if there was a car unlocked and there was something in there to steal, I stole it. If you left your purse somewhere and walked away and you look back, I'm gone with it somewhere. It's not personal. I'm surviving here, right? I robbed every employer I've ever worked for to some degree or other. So I would sit in the meetings and I'm just overwhelmed. I thought, oh my God, I, I, I can't do this. I will not live long enough to make these amends. I can never, and even to the immediate family, I can't even make amends to my parents. It's too hopeless. I've done too much damage to them. They'll ne- I can never make that right. But there's a... My experience as a newcomer, looking at step eight and nine, I think was very much would be like the experience of a kid, say, in fourth grade or fifth grade, looking at the tests he must pass in order to graduate from high school. A kid in the fifth grade is going to look at those tests and say, I might as well quit school. I'll never pass those tests. I'll never even understand the questions. But a funny thing happens if he shows up and goes to the next class and the next homework assignment one day at a time. By the time he gets to the end of the 12th grade, he has everything in place he needs to pass those tests. And that's a very similar experience to what most of us have in Alcoholics Anonymous. When you're prior to step eight and nine, they look insurmountable. But there's a thing that happens in AA that that Carl Jung used to talk about. It's the principle of synchronicity. And what synchronicity is, it's a view of the universe that is a view of a very forgiving, accommodating universe, a, a universe full of God's grace. And what, the way synchronicity works, if you're standing on the edge of a cliff, and you must in your life, whether metaphorically or actually, and you must go over from point A to point B, and you can't go from point A to point B because it's insurmountable. There is an abyss between the two that you cannot transgress. From the moment of need and the second of commitment, the universe starts to rearrange itself to make a gap between, go away between point A and point B. And what, become, what was impossible becomes possible. And we don't know how that works. But the, but the fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous is riddled full of stories of people who have made amends that they could never make. I, uh, I, had, I had some damage that I'd done to my parents that I, I couldn't imagine making it right. And I, people in AA said to me, they said, well, we, we, you're going to have to start addressing this stuff. You're going to have to start making these amends. And I just, I shook my head and I thought, you know, you're well-meaning people. But you don't understand. I did too much damage. I'm never going to make that right. My parents won't have anything to do with me. And, And rightly so. I'm no longer blaming them. I can see enough of the truth now that I get it, that I'm the guy who did this. All my parents ever did was love me. And I just battered them and punished them for that for years. And I, under, I believed with everything in me this was insurmountable. And the people in Alcoholics Anonymous didn't care what I thought. They encouraged me to take certain actions that I tell you, I, I didn't believe they would work. The first thing they told me is, we want you to start calling your mother and you cannot call collect. You must pay for the call. <laughs> first time I did that, I, I, my mom answered the phone. I said, Mom, how you doing? It's Rob. She said, are you in Pennsylvania? No, Mom, I'm in, I'm in Las Vegas. But the operator didn't come on and ask for the, me to pay for the call. I said, no, I paid for the call. And her, her voice went up an octave. She said, 
You paid for the call. She couldn't believe it. I'd always called collect. I, 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 tre- I treated my parents like they were the welfare or something. You know, like I, with some kind of sense of entitlement. You know, they owe me. And they don't owe me. But that's, so, that's what selfish, self-centered takers, that's the position we take in life. And I started, they told me to start sending them cards and letters and little notes and pictures of stuff. And they told me never to forget a Mother's Day or a Father's Day or an anniversary or birthday or Christmas and to buy them a little gift even though I couldn't afford much and to just start doing that. And I did that for that whole first year. And I was about a year sober and my parents decide they're going to come to Las Vegas. And, you know, they don't believe I'm sober, really. You know, because I, they, they've been through seven years of, of, you know, seven years of, oh, dad, I've turned over a new leaf, loan me a hundred. You know, they've been through that over and over. And one of the worst things I did to my parents is I, I give them the illusion I was going to be okay and then dash their hopes again. And I did it over and over and over again. So they, they decide they're going to come to Las Vegas to see me. But here's their attitude. Their attitude is, you know, he's probably a bum. He's probably conning us. And we'll probably go out there and see he's a bum and he's conning us. Hey, but we've never been to Las Vegas. It wouldn't be a total loss. So they came out to Las Vegas with that attitude, really. And I, I met them at the plane and I took them out to dinner that evening with my sponsor and his wife. And then I took them the next night to my home group. And my parents, my parents got to see me with you. And I've never been better than I'm with, I am when I'm with you. Never. And they saw me with the guys in my home group that kidded around with me and the guys I, I ran with and the old timers. And, and they saw me right in the middle of a home group as an active member. And they saw the laughter and they saw that something was different. And I took them to meetings almost every night that that whole week or so that they were in town. And the one night I wasn't going to take them because I started feeling bad because they're not alcoholics. And I'm thinking, you know, I'm thinking, can I shouldn't be subjecting this to them and them, you know, all this. And they called me up. They said, are you going to come and get us? I said, well, mom, I didn't think I'd take you tonight. Well, we want to go. They loved AA. My, I remember one meeting that my, my mom and dad are sitting there and they're laughing like hell at the stories and they think we're funny. And then I, they, some guy was talking about getting his kids back for the first time and they're crying. Oh, this is great. You know, they, they, thought, they loved alcohol. They didn't understand it, but they loved AA. The day before they were to leave to go back to Pennsylvania, I, I had my, my amends thing on a piece of paper. And what, what it was, was not, not only was it a personal amends, but I owed, I owed my father a tremendous financial amends. And it had something that accumulated over a lot of years of me borrowing money from him and never paying him back. You know, times when I was going to go to jail if I didn't pay a fine, and times where I was going to be out in the street if I didn't pay my rent. And, and just I'd, lots of lots of those times. And I figured it out to the best of my ability, and it was a lot of money. It was a lot of money. For a guy making minimum wage, I figured it out as much as I could pay a month, and it was going to take me 12 and a half years to pay him off. And I had my game plan as I was instructed to do, to go to them with this game plan. And I, I went to the coffee shop at the Stardust Hotel, and I sat in there with my mom and dad, and I, I explained to them what I was going to start doing. I wanted to start making payments. And, and they looked at each other, and they smiled. And they, my dad said to me, he says, Rob, he said, he said, we don't want you to pay back the money. He said, this is, he said, we don't understand that much about AA, but this is the first time for years that we ever had any hope that you're going to be okay. All we want you to do is keep doing what you're doing, keep involved with these people, and you just forget about the money. You don't owe us a cent. And I'll tell you something. I was elated. I felt like I hit the lottery or something. I mean, this was a lot. This was 12 and a half years of debt all of a sudden vanished. I mean, this was a big deal to me. And I, I was on cloud nine. I left that stardust. I was going to my sponsor's office to tell him the good news, man. This is great. I'm already thinking about some other financial amends I owe. Maybe I could get them to see the light, you know. <laughs> And I get over to my sponsor's office, and I can't wait. And I'm telling him the good news. My dad says I don't have to pay him. And he says, he says I don't care what your dad says. It's your debt. you got to pay him. And I said, what? 
He said, listen, you're the guy that incurred the debt. You're the guy who said he was going to pay back. It's your integrity. You sold your integrity out a nickel and a dime at a time. You're going to have to buy it back a nickel and a dime at a time. You, it's your debt. You've got to find a made way to pay him. I said, but I, he won't. I can't. If I send him a little check or money order every month, he's not going to cash it. It won't mean anything to him. He says, I don't know. He said, but I believe God will show you a way if you're willing. God will provide you with the wherever. And he will also provide you with the willingness if you don't have that. See, in step eight and nine, there's my business and there's God's business. It's my business to make the list. And I did that in my inventory. And it's God's business to provide the willingness if I ask for it. There's a willingness prayer. It says we, if we don't have the willingness to make these amends, we ask. And the book says we, we just don't ask once. It says we ask until it comes. And then once he provides the willingness, it says, made direct amends to such people wherever possible. And God has to provide that. He has to provide the wherever possible. And if he'll do that, I make the direct amends. But it's God's job to give me the opportunity and the willingness. And it's just my job to respond to that. It's very simple. And so my sponsor said, God will provide you a way. And I, I had no idea what I was going to do. And I'll tell you, I, the funny thing is I worked as a cashier in a store, running a cash register. And my father had one hobby. It was almost an obsess, obsessive hobby. He collected silver and gold coins and old dollar bills and old silver certificates. And I remember watching him as, as a kid sit at the dining room table with the books and the whole stuff, looking at the catalog and the coins and the bills and all that stuff. And I'm working back in the late 70s at a cash register. And in the United States at that time, there was still a lot of silver coins in circulation. They would go through the register almost every day. There was still a lot of silver certificate bills. Old gold certificates were still in circulation. The old wheat pennies in the war, silver nickels. And I just got inspired. And I said to my boss, do you mind if I would buy this stuff out of the register? My boss didn't care. He says, I don't collect that stuff. Do whatever you want. And sometimes $100 gold certificates would come through there and I have to put them away in his safe for sometimes a month before I had the money to buy them. And what a funny thing started happening to me from the moment I started to chip away at my amends. I started having some really good luck financially. And things started happening to me. I started progressing in business and getting bonuses and getting more raises. And I... I, I had a guy that was uh, in AA that had a moving business. He used to pay me $100 for a half day's work helping him move furniture. And what would have taken 12 and a half years took four. And I saved up at face value in rare coins and old bills what I'd owed my father. And I was able to give him that. And my father couldn't have given it back. It would have been like a crack at it giving back an eight ball. I mean, he couldn't have given it back. <laughs> And my, my, father, my father died that following year. And I went back to Pennsylvania and I mourned him and I missed him. And I was able to bury him and there were no ghosts. I know about ghosts. I know what it's like to have someone die and have not have ever made the amends and, and you're haunted by the thoughts of the things you did. And you're haunted by the, the fact that you wished you would have told them you loved them. And you wished you would have said this to them. Or you wished you would have told them how sorry you were. And when my father died, there was no ghosts. And I was free. And his spirit lives within me. When my daughter was born, I remember wanting, wishing so, so much that he could see my daughter. And then getting a feeling... And almost a voice in the back of my head that he said, I see her. I'm here. When I sold my business, when I got successful and I wished my father could have seen that. And I felt that he did. That his spirit was within me. I know what it's like to deal with ghosts. There's a line in the book that says that some people cannot be seen. We send them an honest letter. My grandfather couldn't be seen. Because he died before I ever got sober. And I was haunted by the ghost of him. And it, it was, there was something inside me that just was, it was like a stone in my shoe. I, it always haunted me. And I was encouraged in Alcoholics Anonymous to write my 
grandfather a letter and to do an honest letter and to say in that letter everything I would have liked to tell him if I could have sat across a a breakfast table with him. And in that letter I thanked him for being so kind and loving to me as a child. He was my grandpa. And in that letter I, I thanked him for all the advice he used to give me and how he used to always make me feel like I was his favorite grandson and I don't know if I was but he always made me feel that way and he used to carry me on my shoulders and I told him how sorry I was that through the I had these dark years and that I got involved in alcohol and drugs and I told him how sorry I was that on the day that is of his wife of 60 some years his funeral when he had to bury her that he had to come in and find me on the floor in a puddle of blood with a hypodermic needle in my arm because I'd found the drug she'd been on before she died. And I overdosed in his house. I told him how sorry I was that I had to do that to him on the lowest day of his life. And I said everything into that letter that I would have loved to say to him if I could have seen him one more time. And I took that letter out into the desert outside of Las Vegas and I sat on a rock and I read it and I cried and I burnt it and I'll tell you something this may sound silly to some of you but I I had a feeling inside of me that my grandfather's spirit got that letter and something that was unresolved within me became resolved and there was closure and there was peace and my memory of my grandfather today is sweet and it is not I am not haunted by regret or guilt or shame when I think of my grandfather. I've been back to his gravesite on, on several occasions, and it's, it's always a wonderful experience to visit the gravesites of my family plot in Pennsylvania where they're all buried. It's, a, it's, a, it's just a very moving thing for me. There's other amends in here that... On the bottom of page 77, it talks about seeing someone that we might have hated that we might have hated. And that, you know, most of the amends I'm going to make are people that I've had cases against at some time. And it's the bottom of page 77 and the top of 78, Bill hammers home a point that is crucial in amends. As a matter of fact, it makes the difference between success and failure. And he says it three times in the same paragraph. The bottom of page 77, he starts out by saying it the first time. He says, under no condition do we criticize such a person or argue. Under no condition. He goes on to say simply, we tell him we'll never get over drinking until we have done our utmost to straighten out the past. We are there to sweep off our side of the street, realizing that nothing worthwhile can be accomplished until we do so. And then he says it again in a different way. He says, never trying to tell him what he should do. And he says it again, his faults are not discussed. We stick to our own. And when you think about it, I I understand why Bill's going to hammer that in three times. Because he knows how we are. You know, when you think about it, okay, here's somebody you've built a case against for years, you know. And okay, you've tried to get a different attitude towards him. And you did, this was our course. And you could see yourself in the person. You could see how if you were crazy and sick like they are, you could have done the same thing. So you're kind of understanding him a little bit. And you're forgiving him to some degree. And you're going and you're humbling yourself. And admitting your wrongs, clearing up your side of the street, the temptation at that point to want to straighten them out a little bit is just overwhelming. You know what I mean? Just you got to now that you've humbled yourself and the communication's going, you want to tell them what's wrong with them because you know they need to know. And if you do that, from my experience and from what it says in the book, you will undo everything you've come there to do. Because the minute you start to tell them what's wrong with them, or talk criticizing them, or any of that stuff, you will activate their defense mechanisms, and all the separation that you've come there to overcome and undo, to create the unity, to become more effective and with them, you'll undo it. The minute you start criticizing them, their defense mechanisms will come up and they'll say, yeah, he hasn't changed a bit. He's the asshole I always thought he was. So Bill hammers that in three times. Under no condition do we criticize such a person, never trying to tell him what he should do. His faults are not discussed. We stick to our own. 
One of the hardest amends I've ever had to make, and I think it's the hardest amends any of us really have to make, is for things we've done sober. You know, when when I made amends to people for stuff I did when I was drinking, you know, at least I could hang that on the fact that I was screwed up. You know what I mean? There's, there's, I mean, it doesn't exonerate you, but at least you can kind of stand behind the fact that you were drunk and stoned and all that other stuff. And it, it's a little less caustic to my, to my ego to make those kind of amends. But to make amends for things I did sober in Alcoholics Anonymous is really tough because I can't hang it on anything. One of the hardest amends I ever had to make was to an employer I worked for, for in my for my in my second year of sobriety. I went to work for this guy uh, when I was about a year sober, and it is a cashier in a store. And in those days, I struggled financially a lot, and I would literally live paycheck to paycheck. And I smoked cigarettes back in those days, and I had a heavy cigarette packet pack habit over three packs a day. And I got paid every Friday, and one Thursday afternoon I'm at work and I ran out of cigarettes, and I have this cigarette addiction, and I don't have any money until the next day. So I thought to myself, as I usually do, I thought to myself, well, we sell cigarettes, I will take a pack of cigarettes from the store, and I'll get paid tomorrow, and I'll cash my check, and I'll ring it up. It seemed like a reasonable thing to me. The next day I get my paycheck, and the thought of paying it back goes through my mind but it was easily supplanted with the thought that you know I come early and stay late I work harder than everybody else here you know I'm sure you know everybody does this kind of thing I bet you it's factored into the cost of operation of this business and I opened the door and I started supporting my cigarette habit by stealing cigarettes at work and within no time, I'm, I'm stealing all my cigarettes from in there. I'm a, taking occasional six-pack of Diet Coke for my weekend. And I'm getting sicker and sicker, and I don't know what's wrong. Because I'm not immediately getting sick right there. Sometimes in the realm of the spirit, I take actions over here that make me sick, but I don't get sick over there. I get sick over here. It's a weird thing. And I don't connect the dots easily. And I don't know what's wrong with me. But I'm going to meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous. And it seems to me, everybody in AA is a hypocrite. Everybody in AA is a liar. Everybody's phony. You know, it's like they're all just, you know, full of themselves. And they're all dishonest. And listen to this guy talk about God. Who's he trying to kid? You know, you start getting that stuff. And I'm judging all the people in Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm getting lonelier here. I'm in this relation. I'm dating this girl in this relationship, and I start picking her apart. And then I start on my boss. And I worked for a guy who never mistreated me. He was a great boss, but I'm starting to pick him apart. And we are capable of having that mindset when we get into that judgmental thing and we start looking at people a certain way. I'm telling you, I think you could find fault with Mother Teresa if you look at her the right way. And I'm starting to pick him apart, and I'm getting sicker and crazier by the day. And I don't know what's wrong. And I get down on my knees one night, as I do every night, to thank God for that day of sobriety. And on my knees, I just yelled out. I said, God, what the hell's going on here? And the minute I said it, I knew. I knew that what was happening in my life and all the craziness and sickness of my heart was as a result of me living a double life. I'm stealing from my boss and I'm trying to pretend that I'm an upright, honest member of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I started to figure it out and I figure out how much I'd stolen over this eight or nine or ten month period. And, and it was I, the more I figured it, it was a lot. I mean, it was a lot. I didn't have the money to pay him back. I was going to have to make payments and I'm going to have to go and face this guy. And he's a nice guy, but I'll tell you, he has zero tolerance for retail, for employee theft. I saw him throw a guy and screaming and yelling, throwing a guy out of his store because he caught him stealing. And which is natural in retail, you have to have zero tolerance for that, or else you won't survive. So i got to face this guy, and I know he's going to fire me, and I don't even have the money to pay him, so I'm going to have to go find another job without a reference I can use. And then make payments to this guy. And the worst thing at all is I have to tell him the truth. And this is a guy that has heard me prattle on 
written on many occasions about my program of rigorous honesty in Alcoholics Anonymous. And I went to him and I, I can't I can't even put into words how ashamed of myself I was and what a hypocrite I felt like and what a phony. And I went to him and I told him what I did and to my amazement, he didn't fire me. He got pissed, but he didn't fire me. And he let me stay there and work for him and I figured out exactly what I owed him and I added on another 10% and then I added on another $50 because I know how I am. I'm a minimizer. If, if, there's, if, I'm, if the number is going to be off in any bit, it's probably in my favor. So I'm going to go the other, you know what I mean? Because that's the way I am. So I, I added on 10% and another 50 bucks just to make sure we're going to be even. And I finally paid him back. And it took a while. And I'll tell you, a funny thing happened to me. I didn't, I didn't connect this for a while later. But within 30 days of making that last payment to him, out of nowhere, a guy came to me and for, with a job op opportunity for management in another retail store for almost twice as much money. just came to me. I didn't look for it. I didn't seek it out. It just came to me. And I, made, I put in my notice and I did the right thing. And I went to work for this other guy and I, I, I practiced the principles that Chuck, uh, Chuck Chamberlain taught me and some other members of Alcoholics Anonymous in that business. I never stole a dime. I never took a ballpoint pen home from that place. I gave them 110% every single day. I was of service.